It is delightful to be here. Um, I'm going to shamelessly shout out the mega reunion of the classes of 95, 96, and 97. Because um, I think there's nothing like good momentum. And then I'm going to introduce the panel, and then we're going to leap right in. Uh, and I'm going to acknowledge that I can only see some things with my glasses on and some with my glasses off. And that'll kind of be a journey as we go, I think. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing John Doerr. He's an engineer. He's a venture capitalist. He's the chair of Kleiner Perkins. And he's the author of bestsellers, Measure What Matters, and Speed and Scale, An Action Plan for Solving Our Climate Crisis Now. John serves entrepreneurs with ingenuity and optimism, helping them build bold teams and disruptive com companies. As a pioneer of Silicon Valley's clean tech movement, John has invested in zero emissions technologies since 2006. At Stanford, he has been a guest speaker at the schools of engineering, business, and law. And as Mark mentioned, John and his wife, Anne, provided the foundational support for Stanford's first new school in 70 years. To my left is uh, Arun Majumdar, and he's the inaugural dean of the Stanford School of Sustainability. He also holds the J. Precart Provostial Chair. He's a former director of the Precart Institute for Energy. He's the founding director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy in the Obama administration, Yes. and where he rallied bipartisan support from Congress and other stakeholders. He's also vice president of Google, where he assembled a team to create technologies and businesses at the intersection of data, computing, and the electricity grid. And finally, after a very fine state of the school, thank you, John, this is Dean Jonathan Levin. He is the Philip K. Knight Professor and Dean of our GSB. He's widely recognized for his research in industrial organization, technological change, health insurance, allocation of radius spectrum, and economies of internet markets. John received the 2011 John Bates Clark Medal, which is among the most noteworthy prizes in the field of economics. John was part of the expert group that designed the first vaccine advanced market commitment, and he also helped to design the FCC's broadcast incentive auction. John serves as well on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So I'm going to throw our three very esteemed panelists some questions. Toward the end, some of you submitted questions. I'll ask those questions as well. But we are going to begin with John Doerr, because I believe he will set the stage for us um, theoretically and practically as well. <laughs> so, John, you have chosen, after a life of great passion and great accomplishment, to focus full-time on client. Can you just start by telling us why this issue? Why now? Well, I, I got started in this. Maybe, how, how many of you remember Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth? Yes. Right, so my story is I went to see that with family and friends. And afterwards, we returned to our home for a dinner conversation, what did you think? And some of my wonderful Republican friends said, looks like the planet's warming, science isn't so clear that it's man-made, but this could be a problem. When it came to my 15-year-old daughter, Mary Dorr, she, uh, she said, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. She said, your generation, excuse me, your generation created this problem. You better fix it. And the room went silent. I had no idea what to say, what to do. And so I set out with partners at Kleiner Perkins to try to find solutions to the climate crisis. This is back in 2006, and gradually we invested a billion dollars over three venture funds and about 100 or so startups, most of which failed. It was very hard. But we stuck with these ventures. They're today worth our position anyway worth worth three billion dollars but that that's what got me started i spoke recently with mary about this again and she said dad i'm still scared and we haven't solved this problem what are you what are you going to do and i said <coughs> i don't think my generation is going to solve this it's going to take both of our generations working together to get us where we need to go thank you john um and I, I appreciate that you always um, share stories with such depth and warmth. I appreciate that very much. You've recently written a book. I have been blessed to read it. I suspect many of you have. Um, um, oh, not, not so yes. many. Not so many. That's excellent. I'm really glad you dug into it. It's a good one. Um, 
It's called Speed and Scale. It's an active plan for solving all crime at crisis. But you often say, this book is not a book. And there's a plan in it, but the plan is actually a really important part of the book. So I wondered if you could unpack the book and the plan a little bit, because I think it's so fundamental to something we all need to understand better, and you profoundly understand. And you look speak. at that. I'll, I'll do look the at props Arun. for you. You just speak. Look at I Arun doing Arun. his part. You know, when I was making the decision to back the school and do diligence on it, the one thing I wanted to know was who was going to be the CEO, who was the dean. And Mark Tessier and Levine refused to tell me. <laughs> I committed without knowing, but I didn't sign the check until I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you should know that when the school was announced, the formation of it, my, my friend who I admire enormously in climate, Bill Gates, called up Mark and said, there's one person you want to be the dean of this school. And I'm surrounded by great deans right now. We're incredibly fortunate to have a room. Yeah, so it, it looks like a book, but it's not. Uh, Andy Grove would say it's a plan, an action plan, based on objectives and key results. And there's broad agreement on what we have to do to solve the climate crisis. There's five areas of major emission. Uh, Andy would call these objectives. Jim Collins, one of my favorite teachers from the school, would say these are big, hairy-ass goals. But what makes the plan a plan and not a repeat of the same goals that we know are important are the key results. For every one of these big objectives, like electrifying transportation or decarbonizing the grid, there are three to five specific, accountable, measurable, time-bound actions that we can track and we update and we hold ourselves accountable for achieving these. Um, I think if Andy Grove was alive, he'd be smiling. He'd be happy with the practicality, the pragmatism, and the ambition. This is by no means a done deal. In fact, we are not on track to get these done right now. But the advantage, and I'm not saying this is the only plan or even the best plan. It's an engineer's plan. The numbers and the time frames add up. We can do this, but it will be a mobilization like how the Allies mobilized to win World War II. It's going to call on every, the leader inside of each of you to get this job done. I'm thinking about when you mentioned Andy Grove. And many people in this room were probably lucky enough to take a class with Andy Grove while they were at Stanford, which was, I think, really quite memorable. Um, he talked a lot about inflection points. And maybe you've mentioned this, but I wondered if you could dig in more to why now is an inflection point, how you reflect those ideas in the plan and then in the book. Uh, several forces are coming together to make, uh, make this the inflection point. For starters, it's over 100 degrees in California. You know, for starters, we've had epic floods, uh, droughts. Mm -hmm. the, uh, a, a Stanford alumnus, Hal Harvey, I'm, I'm very taken by his quote. He said, it's now cheaper to save the planet than to ruin it. The cost of solar, the cost of wind, it's now the cheapest forms of energy on the planet in most places in the world. And yet, there are a whole series of obstacles. It's not just what we do, these six objectives, but how we do it in time, the four accelerants, how we win the politics and policy, how we turn movements into action, how we innovate, and how we invest. You know, I, I, I took a lot of crap early in the internet days by proclaiming that the internet had been underhyped. It wasn't at all clear that people could make money selling applications for a buck on a smartphone. Uh, but that turned out to be a big deal. I'll say here today, and I'll take the flack for it, the climate revolution building a new global clean energy economy is the greatest economic opportunity of the 21st century. There'll be thousands of climate Unicorns, says Larry Fink and others, the Gates Breakthrough Energy Fund. Uh, but it's by no means assured that we'll get this done in time. And that's why we have these accelerants. And that's a key part of the inflection point. We only passed the IRA, the biggest climate legislation in the history of the country, with one vote to spare. 
there is not broad global agreement that climate is a top two voting issue in the top 20 emitting regions of the world. That's one of our key results, 8.3 in this program. And so you've got to do more than be personally virtuous. It's not going to matter that you bought an electric, any electric vehicle or put solar panels on your homes. We've got to move others to collective, immediate, and urgent action. And that's why I'll do anything the Stanford Business School asks. You have such a reputation, such a track record, such potential for mobilizing leaders that if we do this with the climate school and we do this with the business school, we'll raise the bar for all the colleges and universities around the world. And that's part of what Mark Tessier, Levine, and Dean Arun want to do with this new school. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to ask a slightly different question, because um, probably most of us, when we read the news about climate change, it's, it's pretty obvious that there are communities that are more deeply affected by climate change than others. And for the people that live in those communities, how do they join the conversation around change? Because they have such a deep investment in it, but sometimes they have less power than other folks. Uh, they have to be organized and mobilized and called upon. There are incumbent, deeply entrenched forces opposed to this new clean energy economy. Um, we've got to make this a top two voting issue. We've got to get a majority of government officials elected or appointed to support the drive to net zero. There are seven specific key results in the movement of movements of people, turning them into action. It's one thing for Greta Thunberg to be a 16-year-old teenager striking outside the Swedish parliament on Fridays. That's what it was in 2018. In 2019, she mobilized a million youth in 100 cities to turn out, and she raised climate to a top two voting issue in seven of the 20 emitting regions of the world, mostly nations in Europe. It is not yet a top two issue in the US. It's not a top two issue in China. It's not a top two issue in India. We need to mobilize, especially with youth, the political support so that the largest, most important climate legislation in our lives doesn't turn on one vote in the US Senate. We are by no means home free. We've got an enormous opportunity, $370 billion of climate investment in the US, which will have profound effects around the rest of the world. But I'm calling on the leader in you, every one of you, to join me in this manifesto. This plan's available for free at speedandskill.com. Download it, get the book, and figure out how you and your life and your family can make this change. Thank you. Arun, I'm gonna start with a table setting question for you because I sometimes think it's useful to just know what you're talking about. First school at the university in 70 years. Tell us about it. How is it going to work? There's three pillars of how it works. Can you just unpack that so everybody can start in the same place with what the school is going to provide and offer? First of all, thanks for inviting all of us to this event. Congratulations to 25 years of reunion. Um, so if you look back in history, academia has always adapted to the needs of the time. We talk about World War II, academic institutions had to adapt. Yes. We sent our folks down for intelligence gathering or looking and breaking codes and you know, Bell Labs sent people up to our manufacturing plants, stop making cars, they made airplanes and tanks, et cetera. So it was all hands on deck effort. But academia had to adapt. And if you look at the Cold War, you know, there was a lot of innovation that happened in academia in response to what DARPA wanted things to be done. And I think this is a time that we have to reimagine academia. Because what does academia value? If you think about it, we value going deep into some field and pushing the frontiers of research and education in a particular field. Climate issue is a wicked problem. Uh -huh. What happens in energy affects water. What ha happens in water affects food. What happens in food affects biodiversity. And what happens in engineering affects finance. What happens in finance affects uh, other businesses. What happens in regulation creates new business models. 
So these are very complex issues which you cannot neatly break down into simple things. So we have to create an educational system that actually explains and gets people, students and others, executives, to really think about how to navigate this and develop the critical thinking skills. Secondly, it is very important that, just, we just heard John talk about the urgency. We have a problem. There's a lot of gloom and doom going around, and as it should be, because we're not on track. But this is where innovation comes in. This is where solutions come in. And it is very important for, for us to figure out not only doing the deep dive in research, but also translate that into solutions mm -hmm. that the world needs today and the world needs tomorrow. And that needs to happen with level of urgency. And so that is the accelerator piece of it. So the way it is structured is that we will have departments where faculty are recruited, students are recruited, degrees are offered. That's a traditional school. The two institutes, the pre court Institute that Mark was talking about, the Woods Institute for Environment are coming in. These are translational piece. We felt that that is necessary but not enough. I was asked to co-chair the committee to, to figure out what the structure ought to be. So we talked across campus with students, faculty, alums, staff, and you know, in academia, not everyone agrees with everything. It's hard to get 100% agreement, but there was one thing that everyone agreed on, is that we need to create an accelerator to accelerate solutions and take it to scale as quickly as possible. That was almost unanimous. And so now we have an accelerator, and that's a unique entity within the school with deep connections, of course, with the school, but also a place where you can take things to scale. And if it doesn't scale, as John was talking about, I can change my personal habits, but that's not going to save the planet. We need to take it to scale, and that's where the accelerator comes in. So can you unpack the accelerator more for folks to kind of visualize that? What are the ideas? Who are the people? What are the dollars? How does it get out into the world? And, and what issues or topics or solutions do you hope get through the accelerator sooner and faster? I'll just give you one example. I'm meeting tomorrow for about two hours with folks at Google. This is um, in the data commons world. And you know, we are, as, as John Punner, we are not on track. So we have, to, we have to think like football. We need offense to mitigate, to reduce emissions. We need defense because of adaptation and, and resilience of communities, because they'll get affected, right? And we need some special teams, negative emissions and all of that. So tomorrow morning, we're meeting about how to create the data, create, use the data to create what Johns Hopkins University created for COVID, uh. where you could go and see what's going on. There is nothing like that today. There's floods going on in Pakistan. This is historic floods. What is the human impact? What are people doing? Can we learn something from there that can be used in floods in Houston? Hopefully we won't have, but it may happen. Heat waves that are going on elsewhere in the world. So connecting the dots, we need to do that now. It should have happened 10 years ago, but we need to do that now. And we can't wait for the United Nations to do it. We gotta just go in, jump in and do it. So this is a global mobilization of organizations, world meteorological organizations, getting the data, creating the database and projecting so that people can understand that this is a Russian roulette that they're playing, that it may, it may happen somewhere else today. We don't have the science to tell where it's gonna happen next. And it could happen in the neighborhood. And so this is an aspect of scalability mm -hmm. that we could do with data. There are many other examples like that. Thank you for that. Um, can you tell us what the experience of a student might look like coming to and through the Institute? So, we are so glad you asked that question because we just had a full day retreat on what the school should do for the, for the students. And one of the things that we are going to do is a curriculum that, that the students will be able to take. And these are not just door school students. These are all students at Stanford should be able to take. And this is if you ask the question, how many students, undergraduates at Stanford take one course, the, the first course in computing, the CS106A, and the answer is shocking, it's 90%. Yes. We want 90 plus percent 
taking a course in sustainability on climate where they are, are not neatly curated with assumptions and they'll be thrown into the mix. Biden, President Biden wants to make the electricity grid carbon free by, one th by 2035, right? We just got the infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act that gives you some tools. How are we gonna do it? How are we gonna navigate technology? What is the state of technology? Does the cost needs to need to come down? Do we have the transmission lines out there? Or how do we deploy solar? How fast can we deploy solar and wind? And do we, do we have the storage solutions to be able to go so that we have reliability on the grid? Those kinds of questions, and there are policy, technology, finance, business models, all of it, markets, all have to be played. So we want our students to be exposed to the reality as opposed to nice, nicely curated. And that's the level, of course, and one of the really sort of creative gentlemen out here in, in the Graduate School of Education happens to be a Nobel laureate in physics, is Carl Wyman. Yes. And Carl is actually helping us develop this curriculum and that we're gonna unleash on our students. So that's just the students. We are going to do the same thing for corporate execs, for policymakers. We have been talking to people in Washington and Sacramento. And can we create, take this decision-making classes all the way to all of them and really mobilize uh, sort of the population that we need to. If you were to look out and tell us what that handful of milestones going forward are where you'd feel like, if we lap this, if we lap this, we feel some comfort we're having success. We're digging in and mattering. Those are the OKRs, <laughs> right. So we're there. <laughs> now the OKRs for the school, I mean, yes. first year, we, ha we are launching the accelerator. It's really critical to get it right, getting the team right, and getting the processes and the culture, the network. We cannot, it's sitting here in Palo Alto, in, in Stanford, we don't know what the real issues are in Louisiana, where the refineries that are going on, there are issues that we need to solve. We don't know the real issues in Tanzania or India. So we cannot do this alone. So one of the goals is to form a global network of partners who will not only educate us, and we have to listen to them, but we co-create solutions with them and help them implement those solutions at scale. So that is part of the accelerator. So the accelerator year one is to get that going in the right way, set it on, on the right track, and we have projects and all that are ongoing. And hopefully we can get a few projects launched out, like hopefully the Johns Hopkins for COVID, that same thing for adaptation, we can hope we can launch that with the effort with partners like Google. So that's, that's one. We are recruiting faculty. John is helping us recruit faculty. And we have, thankfully, with the, with the blessing of the gift, we will be recruiting 60 new faculty. We can't recruit all 60 in one, in one year, but this will be over six or seven years. But the first hires will set the bar of set the tone for what kind of people we're looking at. And so that's gonna be very important. The department, we have a new department, we have curricula, so all of that is year one. Thank you. That's a good, that's a good place to start year one, um, a lot. Um, Dean Levin, I know you and I have talked over the years about your beliefs about really making, and you use the phrase a BGS, which I think is business, government, and society, and how to really help students, faculty, to engage in that sort of BGS arena. And so I'm curious if you can reflect on what you feel like you've been able to take on in the sustainability arena leading up to now, and then how you feel like this will just turbocharge that. Yeah. So um, thanks, Anne-Marie, and it's such a pleasure to have Arun and John here today. Thank you both for, for coming. Um, just say one thing about the school. It, it really is incredibly exciting to have a new school at Stanford. I mean, this is the first new school in 70 years at Stanford. We don't just create new schools. It's a pretty unusual thing. And, um, and actually, uh, I'll, just to, to say one thing about the creation of the school. When uh, about five years ago, the university recognized our president, Mark Tessa Levine, and I was recognized that we needed to do something really significant at Stanford around climate and sustainability. And the part of that, and that part of the recognition was that it, it actually needed to touch every part of the university because there were going to be interesting political science issues to deal with business. It was going to 
climate change was going to hit every area of business. It was going to, there was going to be a need for technological breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs. It was going to affect health, law, everywhere in the university. And there was a committee that Arun alluded to, Arun chaired it, to ask what is the way to mobilize Stanford in a big way around climate and sustainability. And there were two proposals, actually, that Arun came back with. He didn't come back. They, the committee came back with two alternatives. One alternative was to create a college, which is basically like a network across the existing schools, sort of what MIT did with artificial intelligence computing uh, a few years ago. And the other was to create a school. And that came to the executive cabinet, to the deans, and the president, and the provost to debate which way to pursue it. And there was a trade-off in doing that. The, the, uh, the advantage of creating a college is that it would mobilize everyone in the university, and that would sort of lift all, all boats and, 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 and get people focused on, on climate and sustainability everywhere at Stanford, all different students. And there was to create a school. And the benefit of a school is a school is a very special organization. Because just as Rune described, you have to think about who are the faculty, who do you want to be hiring and teaching, and what do you want people to be studying and researching and advancing knowledge in, who are the students, and what are they studying, what's the curriculum, and then how do those things go together? It's an ecosystem into itself, and you have to think about it holistically. And you know, we went with a school. I was a big advocate for school. Everyone was in the end. Um, and when we made that decision, and then Presentation that being announced two days later, we're going to have a new school, which was amazing. Now, as soon as we had that discussion, it was apparent that in having a new school, what was the thing that we needed to take care of outside of the new school? We needed to figure out how to not lose the beauty of that college proposal that Arun's committee had made. How could we actually mobilize people at the business school and the law school and the medical school? And I mean, Stanford is unique as an institution to have the breadth of excellence across all the disciplines. It is a very unusual place in that regard. And so how could we take advantage of that in service of this problem that's really cross, really truly is an interdisciplinary problem, cuts across every area of human knowledge. And so we got started immediately after that. Here, we went to, had a faculty meeting and I said, Let's, let's just start by, we're just gonna, we're on, we were on Zoom, of course. So let's just start by having some Zoom discussions. We'll meet every couple of weeks and we'll just chat. And it would be great to see faculty from all the areas come to have this discussion because sustainability is going to be a marketing challenge for people in market. It's going to be an operations question, how you get to net zero. It's going to be coming up in finance. There's going to be interesting climate finance. There's, we need to, a, someone's got to figure out all the accounting for climate, economics, political economy. It's a leadership challenge. You know, we, 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 first meeting, like five faculty showed up. And they, you know, were sort of a little like John, they sort of said, well, I'm kind of interested in climate change, but I, that doesn't really touch on what I'm doing. By the end of two years of meeting, or a year of meeting, like about 25 faculty were coming to these discussions. People were like, you know, this is really, I, I, I've gotten really interested in climate accounting. I think I might teach a class on it next year. I'm really interested in climate leadership. I've been thinking a lot about the political economy of climate agreements. So you know, just to John's point about an inflection point, it, just as that came under the radar screen of so many businesses all around the country, it came under the radar By the way, the students were there 10 years ago. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so they were like, hey, what took you so long to get going? But um, we, you know, we, now we got there. And, it's been a great partnership with Arun and with, with Cam Muller, who was the interim dean before him. And, and Arun is just off to an unbelievable start uh, with the new school. He's on fire. It's really exciting to see. And when the school starts this year, I mentioned in the last session, we'll have 70 students who are joint degree, MBA, masters at the door school. We'll have, uh, I think, six faculty who were GSB faculty, took a joint appointment. Uh, in the door school, going to help with recruiting and teaching and uh, building the faculty of the school. We'll have, uh, we're going to introduce an executive education program uh, over the course of this year, working together with the faculty from the door school. We'll have a new sustainability entrepreneurship program, which, like Arun said, that'll be open to students from across the university, so GSB students, 
your school students, but then everyone else as well. Some of my favorite things that have happened in the last couple of years among our students related to climate sustainability are um, uh, things that got started when our students, MBA students, connected with either students or faculty from around the university. So I'll just give you one example of this, just to, but I hope it will be many more in the next couple of years. One of, we had a student who was graduated from the MBA program in 21, and um, he had a background. He worked at Tesla as an engineer. And he came here and he wanted to do something in batteries. And before the pandemic started, he wrote an email to one of the material science faculty over in the engineering school. He said, hey, I'm really interested in batteries. You know, I read some of your papers. Can we come talk? This is a fellow who's using, who does his, his lab is all about using AI to optimize battery design. And they got to know each other a little bit and they went to lunch one day and they said, well, let's start a company. And uh, they started a company when, when our student uh, graduated and, and the day after graduation, I went for a walk with him. And we were walking around the Stanford campus and, um, and he said, uh, he said, when I was asking him about, he said, the, the, he said, this clean energy revolution, this is just to John's point, he said, this is going to be the, this is going to be the, the digital revolution, the next digital revolution. This is going to be huge. And I'm going to be at the forefront of it. I'm going to build a giant successful company. He's got a great pitch, by the way. You could see he raised a lot of money and you could see why. And, uh, and, and he said, um, he says to me as we're walking around past the quad, he says, you know, in 25 years, I'm going to come back from my 25th re year reunion. He said, this place is going to be different. He said, now everybody thinks of this as Silicon Valley. He said, this is going to be the future of the clean energy. Because oh, I'd asked him, why did you start your company here? Is this the right place? And he said, in 25 years, from my we're going to go for a walk. And we're going to look around. And he said, this is going to be all the great clean energy companies are going to be located right here. And I'm going to have started one of them. So you know, that's a great. Who knows if his company's going anywhere? It's a venture-backed company, you know. Like John said, some of them are going to work out, some of them aren't. But you know, th that's the kind of thing that I hope we're going to get going over the next couple of years with this new school. It's going to be an amazing opportunity for our students and for Stanford to really do something meaningful. Actually, this guy is so good at fundraising. He raised money from me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much money, but I put my own money in. To, but, you know your pitch is good when two people are talking about your pitch and they know who you're talking about. <laughs> um, and he I've, told me he can, you can retire with, this, with your investment. <laughs> no, you can't retire. Yeah, was, <laughs> <laughs> that's not working out for you. Um, Dean Levin, I have another question for you. As you scan this group of faces and, um, and the armies of other folk who have left the GSB, I think alum are really eager to know how they can engage. And I think it's, and I mean this respectfully to Mark, it's easier to engage if you're an energy guy. But what if you're just a super capable leader and manager and knower of much content? How do those folks come and say, I, I want to be part of this? Yeah, so I'll, actually, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something and at the risk of um, uh, uh, putting one of my faculty members under a deluge of emails. But um, our faculty member at the GSB who's been leading our business and sustainability efforts is a fellow named Bill Barnett. He's taken a joint position also at the, <clears throat> at the Door School. And um, you could email him. <laughs> and well, he's not going to be able to do this forever, but he, he actually, he's been amazing. One of the things when he started doing this about, we, he and I started those discussions about two years ago here at the school about what we were going to do on sustainability. And he's been just an amazing leader in getting uh, our efforts going. And I think really helpful in the design of the, of the school as well. And um, he, one of the things he said at the beginning was, you know, we don't know who of our alums are interested who are either working on climate issues or sustainable issues or just have an interest in getting involved. We, we don't have a list of that, and I need to compile one. And he, so if you want, you can look him up, Bill Barnett, and shoot him a note and say, hey, I'm interested. And we'll find, we will, you know, I don't know, we'll have something for you to do right away, but we would love to just know that you're interested and excited and want to be involved, and that way that'll give us a chance to, to engage you over time. Please, John. I'll suggest three things you can do. And these are actions. These are part of the action plan. First of all, get your organization to commit to net zero by 2050 to make and meet those commitments. Second of all, uh, you're a parent maybe, 
or you're part of a public school district, get your school district to adopt electric buses. Mm -hmm. There's funding for it. The climate payoff is, is phenomenal. Uh, and the third thing that you can do is vote. Demand that at every level of government, we have pro-climate, pro-new clean economy leadership. Thank three you, things. John. Those are really excellent three things. And those are so much about re-reminding ourselves of why being civically engaged people matters so much. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna turn over to some questions people sourced up. And the first one's for you, Arun, and I, I suspect you answer this question all the time. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion about corporate funding for the school, particularly dollars from folks who are fossil fuel earners. How do you think about that in your own strategic planning? Yeah, this has been a topic of much interest, I would say. Um, look, I think the school per se is not going to take funding from fossil fuel companies for its operations. It's research funding that comes. And um, for sponsored research projects, uh, there is an academic freedom issue. Faculty can work with anyone as long as they can comply with the, uh, the rules and regulations of the dean of research. So that's there. The issue comes in when you have initiatives that are like what's called affiliate funding, et cetera. And I think that this is a, uh, so let's, let me back up. I think we all know where we want to be. We want to be fossil free. There's no question about it because the emissions, we have to pay for the, the, the penance of emitting in the past is a negative emissions thing. We have to do that. The question is the pathway mm -hmm. and who do we engage with along the journey, right? And um, I wrote a letter to the whole community saying that we should not be working, these are my own values, we should not be working with companies that deny climate change, undermine the science of climate change, misrepresent our partnership with them, them and block and tackle uh, policies in climate change. And, you know, and they say something, climate commitment, but they're doing something else, mm -hmm. right? That's, we should absolutely not work with. But I also said that painting the whole industry with one brush it, you know, may not be wise. And I think there are some companies that are trying to move in the right direction and they have made commitments, they're trying to keep their commitments. And, um, and so I think we should, if we can, if we see that they're doing the right things, at some point we have to say that they have the scale that is needed to address this issue. We operate at the laboratory scale out here, so we need partners. And at some point we have to say this is all hands on deck. And so that's been my position, but I've also said that, look, this is my position today. I'm not fixated on this. I would like to listen to what others have to say. And I've gone around listening to students, student groups during summer, and a lot of students are not here right now, so in the fall, I'm really eagerly waiting for the students to come back so I can have these conversations to find out what are people saying. And we are going to then collect all that people have said without any attribution and say, this is what people are actually saying right now. And then see how to, then figure out how to actually mobilize campus. So it's actually a really iterative process. I'm sorry? It's a really iterative process. Yes, it's an iterative process. That's right. But I think we all have to be sure where we want to be. We yes. want to be fossil free. And it's the question is the journey. Um, I'm going to defer to any of you on this question. Um, and I want to ask it soon enough. So if there's things we want to thick it out, we can do that. Um, but are there other pieces? And each of you have highlighted pieces. So maybe you've gotten most of this in the mix. But are there aspects of climate change, are there aspects of the school that haven't come to the fore, that if people leave the room not knowing those things, they won't be as rich for it? I think the issue I strongly feel, having grown up where I grew up in India, environmental justice is an international issue. And I think we need to pay attention to this. This is unbelievable global transition that we're going to face. You talked about World War II. This is World War III, okay. frankly. The transition that we're going to have, we can't leave people behind. At the end of the day, this is about humanity. And I think it's going to be very important that we look at, at this globally. We are, Stanford is a global you know, platform. And we have to understand that. And uh, so that's something in, in my senior associate dean and leadership, we have someone looking at international partnerships. 
We are someone looking at environmental justice and to make sure and diversity equity. So this is something that we are very, so we're trying to create the culture in the school to make sure that it is inclusive as we go through this transition. We have to go do the mitigation, negative emissions, and the, the football analogy, I can repeat that again. But that's, we have to do that. Yes. But it's at the end of the day, we cannot, because we are, we could be in an echo chamber in the local community and think that we are solving the problem where the issues could be quite different and complex elsewhere, and we gotta listen. Thank you for that. I'd like to take Please. an invitation to echo something on this, this very topic. We would not have passed the IRA without the steadfast support and activism, activism of the green advocacy groups. And they knew and they said, as long as there's $300 billion in the IRA, they will back and they will support this. So building a durable political consensus goes beyond social justice. It's political pragmatism in terms of getting this job done. There's a, a quote, and the best quote in this book comes from a graduate of the business school, Laureen Paul Jobs, and she says, the closing quote, the climate crisis should be looked on as one of the greatest opportunities greatest opportunities that has ever been presented to humankind to deal with education equity, health equity, and economic equity. And I'll note for folks who don't know that um, John and I are both mutually quite fond of Loreen. Um, we have different relationships with her, but we are both quite fond of her and we both really admire her focus on climate too. Her, I, I think she committed $3.6 billion. Yes, we have a climate, climate foundation just focused on climate. Up until now, philanthropy and climate has been 2% of U.S. philanthropy, 2%. It needs to be 20% or more. Can I just underscore one thing that John said? Mm -hmm. People are really happy about the Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, infrastructure bill, and they should be. But this is a very small slice of what needs to happen. These are only the carrots. If you look at the infrastructure, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act for hydrogen and all, these are only the carrots. No you sticks. cannot change the economy with only carrots. There needs to be sticks. We need a price on carbon. We need clean energy standards because we will not get economy-wide deployment of solutions without the sticks and carrots. The carrots are great to create you know, reduce a green premium or green, create green opportunities, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if you want economy-wide change, you have to have carrots and sticks. And for that, the political mobilization that is needed to get the sticks in place will be even harder than what it was to get the carrots. Carrots are easy. And I, I really think it is important to think uh, a mobilization of the population to think that this is in their interest to do that, no matter where they are in the United States. Thank you for that. Um, maybe another question I'll ask, and this is actually kind of a more pedagogical question, but I, I kind of appreciated when people searched up questions. They didn't entirely know what we'd be talked about today, so they were bringing up different ideas. Um, but it was a question around how you pedagogically train and teach around thinking about the trade-offs involved in creating sustainable opportunities. And so the example this person used in the question they sent in was, it's so clear that moving to electric vehicles is important, but there's also this piece around, and it's a social, social it's a political, there's lots of mining that then takes place, and it's not just about the communities where it happens, but it's also about the cost of doing that mining to get you to a new EV future. So how will you think about that when you're supporting students and being leaders in this arena? So I look at it, it's not an either or. I think we often fall in the trap of, if you do this, this might happen, so we can't do this, right? And then you're in paralysis. So we have to go towards clean energy economy, whether it's battery materials and mining for that, and we have to do the mining in an environmentally responsible way. Whatever we do at that scale could have environmental impact. Right? likely to have. And the question we have to ask is, you know, the trade-offs, as you pointed out, how do we mitigate the environmental impact as much as we can um, and still move, mobilize towards a, the issue of climate change? So I think we have to do both. 
And if you ignore one, that's going to, the unintended consequences of that will be devastating because we are now living in the unintended consequences of the 20th century. We never thought, well, people had raised it, they ignored, right? So we have to look at the, as part of our effort, whether it's research, education, and or deployment or solutions, we got to look at the unintended consequence of what we do and mitigate as much as possible. I'll just, one thing I would add to that is I, I think the places where the, in terms of carbon reduction, the places where the trade-offs are the most salient are not in the United States and they're not in the developed world, they're in the developing world. It, it, I mean, the U.S., carbon emissions peaked in 1995 in the United States and they're down 40% off peak in the U.K. and throughout a lot of Europe they're, they're down. And um, we haven't borne that much economic cost for leveling off carbon or, or even for reducing it in, in, in Europe. Technology has, has advanced to make it, as John already said, cheaper to do, in many cases, renewable energy production. And so the big trade-offs and the hard problems, a lot of them are in the developing world where the trade-offs are, you know, oh, there's something incredible about illumination. We take it for granted, but you need to have lights on to be able to educate kids and let them learn to read, and that means you need more power and more electricity in India, throughout Africa, in parts of China. And so the really hard problems, a lot of them, are about how do you get better technologies out to those countries and and, and ways of, of alleviating those trade-offs so they're not facing an incredibly stark trade-off between warming up the planet and having the lights on for the people who live there and you want to move out of poverty. And that's a hard trade-off, and I, I think that's one where the places like Stanford can make a real difference, actually, because partly that, how do you address that, how do you alleviate that trade-off? Partly it's about having great technology and great science and great ideas. Hopefully we're gonna generate some of those. We already have some of those. And how do you then take ideas, technologies like that, and actually get them to scale in low cost ways? And that's a, that's a huge, huge challenge for the world and, and one where I, that's the kind of thing where I hope Stanford could really make a big difference in the next decade. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to ask each of you to field it if you want. Um, I mean, I guess the observation I would make is that many people in this room have a Mary door. They've got some young person in their life who's really angry, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, I was talking to an angry, uh, an angry person this morning, although she was really more having trouble with dropout at college. Um, so we've discussed climate, but not today. Um, <laughs> but I guess I'm wondering if each of you could leave us with something where when you've looked that way, you've thought, this gives me some optimism or hope. It could be a student. It could be a project. It could be an organization. But something where on this path that we know is going to be rough, that we know needs to get a lot more sticks on it that it doesn't have right now, and those sticks are going to really catch a lot of us, um, what, what's something that each of you really feels hopeful and optimistic about? I'll start. Um, a very good friend of mine also happens to be a GSB alum and the longest serving board member on Tesla is a guy called Ira Aaron Priest. That class of 96. Class of 96. Ira is ours. Did you take a roll call and say he's not here? Uh, I'll let him know that he's not here. Uh, unless he's here in the audience. His, he called me one day and he said that my daughter is in high school and she has created this climate boot camp for high school students. Would you be willing to speak to them? I said, sign me up. And she's now going to, I just saw her, she's going to college right now. And she's going to get this to the college level um, and really mobilize the youth. And that gives me a lot of hope because the next generation, and this is one individual, if you look at Google searches on sustainable products, um, that is going up exponentially, not just in the United States, worldwide. There's data out there. So I think there is the youth, the next generation, um, as John pointed out, it's not just our generation, but ours and the next, so that we can save our grandkids and the great grandkids. I think that's what is giving me a lot of hope about the next, so I'm really looking forward to undergraduates coming here 
and, and listening to them and helping them. Thank you. Two things give me great hope. One was a conversation after an interview about this book or plan with a reporter from the Business Insider who turned off her tape recorder and said, John, I want you to know that what I've been doing with my daughter at home every night is reading together a page or two from the book. And we talk about it. And I never imagined when writing this <laughs> engineering plan that it would have that audience and that awesome impact. But it brings me to remember something that I heard first from Arun, which is the proverb is that we inherit the earth from our ancestors. It's not quite right. What's really going on is we're borrowing it from our children. And that's something that gives me great hope. I'm pretty hopeful about what these folks are doing. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's great to have this school and to have John's gift. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Arun. This is a really, really wonderful way to launch into a weekend together. We're deeply appreciative. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anne -Marie. <laughs>